Hello and welcome to U.S. News and World Report. I'm Simon Owens and here with me is Stephen Harper, author of the new book, The Lawyer Bubble, which explains why law schools are churning out more lawyers than we'll ever need and why those lawyers often regret the career paths they've chosen. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, thanks, Simon. Nice to, nice to be on. Thanks for having me on. <clears throat> well, um, one of the most interesting things uh, in your book is when you write about how legal education fundamentally changed in the 1890s with what's called the case method. Um, what was legal education like before this method was created versus afterward? Well, it was more of a of a one-on-one -on -one kind of training session where you learn specific rules, uh, memorize them, um, and there were there were inherent limits in terms of how many students a particular professor could uh, deal with in a, at any given time. And what the case method did was transform it into a world where you could teach a large numbers of students very efficiently with a very few number of faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things you talk about in the book, and I see this a lot living in Washington, D.C., is that uh, a sizable portion of people go to law school not because they really want to be lawyers, but they don't know what else to do. Uh, that seems like a really expensive decision to make merely on a whim, right? It's a real problem. It's, you know, I, one, of the, one, of the, one of the ways I describe it is law school has been for many years, and it was even true when I went to law school, although it didn't apply to me, it, it was the last bastion of the liberal arts major who couldn't decide what to do next. Um, the problem now, as you correctly observe, is that it's a very expensive ticket uh, to defer a choice for three years about what to do next. Eighty-five percent of today's graduates come out of law school with, with law school educational debt exceeding a hundred thousand dollars so when you're coming out with a home mortgage but but no house um, it's a it's a it's a prescription for disaster the other part of the problem frankly is that uh, people wind up going into law school either with uh, distorted expectations based on media images um, or things they've read everyone wants to be Clarence Darrow and Atticus Finch of course um, but the reality is much different and and uh, when you don't have a reality that m matches the expectations that you had going in, it's a prescription for psychological stress much later, which is why one of the reasons I think a lawyer suffers from such uh, unusually high rates of, of distress, uh, both not just career satisfaction, but clinical depression, substance abuse, alcoholism, and all that sort of stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a complicated dynamic that is really troublesome. Mm -hmm. But they have this, you know, same access to calculators as we do. They know that the, uh, the, the industry is producing way too many lawyers. It seems like uh, they would be able to make these, these kinds of calculations uh, and reading the articles about the, you know, the lawyer bubble, um, that they would be able to figure this out, that they really should have uh, a stronger case for actually going to law school. Yeah, think. they should. And it's, and, but the thing to also to remember is that the transparency that you're describing is much truer now than it was, say, three, even three years ago. I mean, up until uh, last year, if you went on any law school uh, website, it would tell you that the industry employment rate for all graduates was 93 or 94 percent. And it wasn't until the ABA started requiring uh, law schools to break that number down that we realized that it turned out that employed, as far as law school deans were concerned, could mean being, mean, mean being a, a barista in a coffee shop or a greeter at Walmart or somebody who waited tables. So that when you, now of course, you, you know, we're learning that it turned out that the actual employment rate for, for graduates that were getting that are getting long term just defined as at least a year uh, full time jobs requiring a JD is uh, 55 percent which is which is pretty bad but again I say that's a new that that information even that information is a new development the other thing that's working here in a very profound way and it afflicts all of us is what is what psychologists call confirmation bias you know we want to embrace a view of the world and of ourselves that's consistent with what we already believe so even if a student sees well it's 55 or 60 percent the immediate reaction um, among many students is to say well I, I can be in the top 55 or 60 percent that's easy so I'll be in the I'll be in the good group um, but the bad group is very large and not everyone who thinks they're going to be in the good group winds up there Mm -hmm. And you talk a little bit about how law professors, they don't have a lot of real-world experience as lawyers. They go straight from academia to teaching. How does this shape the curriculum they're teaching from a practicality standpoint? Well, it becomes uh, problematic. I mean, the, there's nothing wrong, in my view, with, with law professors who spend a lot of time doing scholarly work in 
investigating uh, legal theory and teaching the, the important philosophical underpinnings of the law. Most of that kind of education happens in the first year of law school. And it's really important, and I, I don't really have any, suggest, any strong idea or, or notion that that ought to change. Uh, but by the time you get to year three, um, most lawyers will tell you it was a waste of time. Most practicing lawyers would tell you even, that, and, it's always, and it's been a waste of time for a very long time. Uh, Clarence Darrow didn't go through three years of law school. He went through a year of law school, and then he did an internship in Ohio, and then he sat for the bar. Um, so the problem of the, of the three-year curriculum is largely a problem of state accreditation requirements that mandate the kind of uh, uh, academic program that it really takes three calendar years, three academic years to complete. Um, so what? But so in order to deal with that problem, I think law schools finally now are beginning more and more to say, well, all right, if we can't get rid of the third year, let's try to make it at least more meaningful. And making it more meaningful means giving these graduates, uh, many of whom are, all of whom really, are moving it, uh, into a very tough job market, some actual practical skills so that if they can't get jobs in big firms, or even if they can, maybe they can have the wherewithal to be able to hang out a shingle or somehow make a living practicing law. The difficulty is there's a tension between the kind of track that it has taken to be successful as an academic and what it means to be a practicing lawyer. So that that, that tension um, sometimes it just it can just create issues for law schools trying to change the directionally where they're happening. And and many the the, the truth is that for most uh, tenured faculty in law schools, they have very limited, if any, practical experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been numerous surveys about the widespread career dissatisfaction among practicing lawyers, but one exception to this are lawyers who work in the public sector who seem to be much happier. Why is this? It's an ironic, uh, paradoxical situation because obviously the money is not as good as it is in the big firms that we read about all the time. Um, you know, this is just my own personal view, but my theory is that it has to do with the feeling of meaning that you get when you feel like you're actually doing something that's helping people or contributing to a larger social good. And I think that people that go into and have public interest jobs are happier because they have, a, a, perhaps in many cases, more autonomy over their lives and they have a greater sense of satisfaction, you know, closer perhaps to the mission of the, of the law, closer to have perhaps to uh, medicine. Um, but uh, that, that's, at least that's my belief about what accounts for that. And, and the other, of course, is the negative flip side, which is that in big firms, big law firms, where they're the, great, the, the dissatisfaction is the greatest, um, I think just from observation um, and from talking to people over a course of, of many years uh, in, the, in, that, in those firms, that I think it, increasingly the, the prevailing business model has become very hostile to notions of, of balance and leading a full life and, and, and the work that you do can often be very mundane mm -hmm. uh, and, and boring. And you, and you used to work for one of these large firms and you talk a lot about in your book about how the cultures and sizes have changed over the past few decades. Um, I remember you quoting one that back in the late 60s, the largest firm only had maybe 161 lawyers. Um, how is that compared to today? Largest firm today has over 4,000 lawyers. Um, the firm that I joined, which is now which is still a big firm, and, and I have to always qualify it whenever I give an interview or talk about this, to, uh, what I say by letting people know that I, am, I, am, I have been, by and large, for my entire career, a very satisfied lawyer. So I fall into that, unfortunately, increasingly rare breed of, of lawyers that really feel very fulfilled um, and led positive lives. And frankly, one of the reasons I, I wrote the book was to remind people that that's not an impossibility. Um, and that perhaps maybe we could do things a little differently to restore that kind of life. But when I joined my firm, uh, Kirkland and Ellis, in 1979, I think I was about the 150th lawyer, and now it's 1,500. And you know, as institutions generally get larger, the po the potential for greater impersonality uh, is one problem. But in big law firms, in particular, the drive to maximize short-term profits, I think, has become an overriding problem because when all you're focused on are the short-term metrics, things that you can measure that contribute to the bottom line, you risk not counting things that are more difficult to measure, like long-term uh, institutional stability, uh, collegiality, mentoring, all of the qualities that, in my view, make the profession a profession. Mm -hmm. 
What about from a diversity standpoint? Something like 40% of law graduates are women, um, but we're not seeing those same ratios on the top nation's top law firms, right? Uh, you're certainly not seeing them in the leadership ranks. So that if you go to, the, for example, the equity partner owners of big firms, uh, the female representation has been around 15% for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, I'm not sure why that is. There, there are a lot of explanations. I mean, a little bit of it has to do with the nature of, uh, of, of women and the biological imperative in terms of, of having children. But that, that doesn't even begin to account for that kind of disparity. And I think what it really reveals, frankly, is that to a very large degree, and again, I don't want to over, overstate the case because not every firm is alike, but I think to a very large degree, big law firms in particular still are, uh, are by and large men's clubs. Mm -hmm. So I guess same, my, same, old, same old. I'm sorry. The same old is true for for uh, minorities as well. The, the minority representation in big law firms is, uh, particularly again among the equity partner ranks, uh, has not increased uh, appreciably uh, over the last ten years. Mm -hmm. So I guess my final question is: is say you're someone who's considering going to law school uh, in 2013 or beyond, what are the questions they should be asking themselves before they commit? A really great question. Um, the first thing they ought to do, I'm joking of course, is read my book. All, of those, all, those, all those critical things are in there. But the, what the, but the, and, and the reason I wrote the book is really to, because of the course that I teach. And what I encourage students to do in that course are, is several things. One, think really hard about yourself and your own personality and the kind of qualities that you have that you think um, would make you an appropriate candidate for satisfaction in the legal profession. And to do that, you've got to do two things. One, you've got to take a really hard look at yourself. And number two, you have to take a really hard, unbiased look at the profession and what lawyers do in the profession. There are lots of different things you can do and lots of different ways to practice law. Um, and no one right, no, there's no one right path for everyone who should do it. But I think if there was, if people spent more time thinking about it, um, in, in, in very concrete ways, and not just assuming that everything's going to work out okay. Uh, don't be suckered in by the by the temptation of federal money that flows very easily and really, frankly, subsidizes this mess. Um, uh, do what you can to to take advantage of the increasing transparency that's out there, but don't give up on that. And, and don't defer the decision to a metric. And uh, no offense, uh, uh, Simon, but you know there are m many students that simply say. Look, I'm just going to go into the highest ranked U.S. News Law School, period. That is a very um, unintelligent way to make a decision like this. Um, and so I encourage students to take a you know, really hard look at, at things that really have nothing to do or very little to do with rankings. And, mm -hmm. and then just decide who you are and what you want to be. Okay, Stephen. Well, those were all the questions we had. Thanks for, so much for joining us. Thank you, Simon. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.